Welcome everybody to Off The Shelf. My name is Dr. Fahim Shakur uh, and along with uh, Mr. Ray Radford, consultant ophthalmologist and Dr. Mehran Javid tonight, consultant psychiatrist. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you watching and listening wherever you may be in the world. So for those of you who are familiar with Off The Shelf, this is a monthly book club from 8 p.m. UK time, usually for an hour. And it's on the last Sunday of the month, we've had a collection of really interesting books throughout the year. Uh, and we rotate the books on a rotation policy from the uh, conveners of this book club. And the recording is available on Facebook Live and YouTube Live for anyone who misses today. Just a few book club rules as per with any book club, we try and avoid interruptions whilst one person is speaking. Uh, drink is fine. I think we've got a few beverages on the show here. Uh, and always, uh, we, we like to make educational things free as always. So this will always be a free part of the Med Talks brand. Today's book is Reckoning with Risk. Um, looks like this, as it shows by Gig Gigarenza. You got your book, Merhard. Good. You read it. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> um, and so let's give you a, a short uh, rundown of the book uh, before I bring in my co-host tonight. So Reckoning with Risk is a book all about learning to live with uh, uncertainty. And it's written by Gerd Gigarenza, who's a director of the Center for Adaptive Behavior and Cognition at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin and a former professor of psychology at the University of Chicago. There's a, there's a very alluring front cover for this book with a, a gentleman uh, precariously trying to balance on top of uh, two chairs along with a table stand on perhaps on top of a skyscraper. And I think that is the theme of what he's trying to portray is how risky is life and how risky are the decisions we make in life. As a general practitioner, this is something I do every day, uncertainty in terms of managing a patient. Should they stay in the community? Should they be admitted? Do we watch and wait? Do we monitor? This is part and parcel uh, of my profession, but I am interested to hear both my co-panelists' thoughts about that. Without giving away too much, um, the book was written in 2002, very well referenced, um, and although perhaps not the easiest of reads, um, is a manageable read um, and just takes over 250 pages. We try and keep our books uh, less than 300 pages per book club. The book is uh, divided up into different chapters to do with managing risk. We have chapters on innumeracy, screening, as well as other things to do with insight, uh, DNA fingerprinting takes a place, and basically all of these things. I think the mantra, as they say in statistical circles, is uh, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. And if we remember that, I think with a pinch of salt, then you can actually go through this book and there's a lot to learn. The book actually had me hooked from the first page, really, with a, an actual um, anecdote about a lady who had a HIV test, and that came back as a false positive test, but she was given a, what and those terms was a, a terminal diagnosis, and then it led to perhaps more risk-taking behavior by herself, and then a follow-up test showed that the previous test was actually the wrong result, and then that changed her life. So it gave a lot of interesting results to do with what an incorrect result can do to a patient, um, as well as to the practitioner as well. In many ways, uh, the book made me think in so many different ways. Often we think about, for instance, uh, airline safety, and it made me think differently because in airline safety, you have to remember the pilot is fully invested in making sure everyone is safe because they are technically one of the passengers as well as steering the ship. Whereas in a patient-doctor relationship, one of the themes of this book is it's different. Yes, we do care about the patient a lot, but it, if a mistake happens, they're not in the crash like an airline pilot. And so maybe when we do always focus on, you know, we should be more like the airline industry, we have to take into account these obvious differences. There's many things that it talks about. We'll talk about the illusion of certainty, uh, which is an interesting phrase that's used, clouded thinking, communicating risk, how that's done to the general population and public. Uh, and I want to touch on what Ray said to me off air that I want to bring in and that you actually thought this is a book that every doctor should read, Ray. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as to why that's the case. And Meron, I'd like to hear tonight as to how, how you found this book insightful, hopefully in your practice and what you take away from it. This book actually uh, came in my hands via an interesting route. 
of uh, one of my dad's friends and he actually passed it on to me many years ago it was published this book in 2002 so it's been around for a while now and with any book with medical statistics or facts they can go out of date so i would actually ask anyone who reads this book not to use it as a journal in that sense because some of the statistics will be undeniably out of date by the time you've read this they say that for many textbooks i guess Right, so that's a bit of a um, small uh, pen picture of what the book's about in terms of what's going through it. I want to actually now bring in my co-host so we can actually hear from them uh, just general terms, what they thought of it and uh, whether they think it was uh, a book worthy for everyone to read and actually get into. Ray, may I start with you? What are your initial thoughts on the book? Yeah, thanks, Fahim. Yeah, I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, as you said, uh, not the easiest book. It makes you think. Um, and, and as as you've already said, I think as a as a doctor and as a surgeon, we're talking about risk almost every day uh, to our patients. And patients will you know ask about an operation: is it safe? You know what could, what can go wrong? And therefore, how you how you talk to patients, how you communicate to patients is is really really important. And everyone has a different way of, of being able to understand or take it taking in information. Um, and I think this book's really useful because it it makes you as the doctor as the as the professional think a great deal harder about how you would communicate and how you would use these figures people talk about a a percentage risk but as a as a the book teacher as a as a, as a standalone statement a percentage doesn't mean very much and it makes the point very early in the book that you you as a surgeon using a figure to a patient how they interpret it could be completely different from how you've intended it to be um and that, that pattern is repeated throughout the whole book. Um, I think it's really important, the message that's repeatedly made, is that how we, or how, what, what, we, what we think we understand ourselves as a professional and what training we may have had in statistics often isn't as good as we think it is. Uh, and I think we're probably all being guilty at some point of sharing information and actually not understanding the real, the real figures. Uh, and this book has, highlights lots of very useful ways to become far better at understanding the the big picture, and therefore being able to to share with patients what the what the true risks are. Thank you. Um, it's a great vignette there, uh, Mehran. Can you add a bit to what Ray said about your thoughts on the book? Yeah. So, uh, so this book, as as you alluded to, Fahim, it's just over two hundred fifty pages or so. It's it's ends quite nicely with a set of fun problems to kind of test your uh, test your ability to have paid attention. It almost feels like a lecture, um, you know, where he takes you uh, by uh, under a shoulder, under his wing, and kind of educates you in terms of this is what you knew then. This is how I would try to educate you about the, the real issue here. So I think there's there's three parts to this. There's dare to know, understanding uncertainties, and then from innumeracy to insight. So he goes through different stages um, of how uh, of how the importance needs to be fully understood. And as you said, Fahim, I got hooked from the beginning. Talks about the Susan's nightmare of being diagnosed with HIV, who was assumed to be positive. Uh, and then she lost her job because everyone else thought she was positive. And that meant that she very much acted in anger and disregard in terms of risk management and, uh, and being intimate with groups of individuals who she never would have been. Um, so the, the the concept of false positive never really entered her realm and neither did it with ongoing people that supported her through her journey. Um, and the thing about the Prozac, which is fluoxetine, one of the antidepressants, um, I can relate to how numbers are understood. It perhaps doesn't, it's not the proportion, it's the actual numerical value. So I've broken, so that's led to kind of my own practice change and actually using multiples of five or 10 and trying to relate a simpler message. Um, but at the same time, I acknowledge that who's, whose needs am I trying to meet? Uh, and that's that's what this book goes in, uh, quite, quite far into. So I, I thought it was a really insightful book. Um, something that I'm still going through to this to this day, uh, and it is a reference book, Ray, it's something that's going to stay on a bookshelf and it keeps getting uh, referred to. It's already quite cr crunkled, uh, or crinkled, I should say, um, but something I really thoroughly enjoyed. Excellent, great, no, that's good. 
Ray, I want to come specifically to what you enjoyed most about the book. Uh, I'll just start. I mean, I really liked the way that um, he used uh, concepts to explain risk to, to people and break it down as to how he manages it. And sometimes the anecdotes about um, doctors who struggle to say, I don't know, obviously, I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, someone from the WHO said, uncertainty is a threat to practitioners. It's hard to say. I don't know, because the, the patient often looks to the doctor to give them that certainty. So I enjoyed all of that. But what did you find the most interesting and enjoyable, Ray? Um, well, to, to go on from what you're saying, really, is this this whole thing about the doctor's, doctor's position or the professional, because later in the book we talk about lawyers, we talk about people in court and judges. But anyone with a senior position is assumed by the public to be an expert in their field. And there's that there's that perception that, these people are doing their job to the best of their ability and using all the available information that's there. Whereas this book highlights from the from the very beginning that level of uh, perception and your your certainty as a member of the public that these professionals do have everything at their fingertips. I think that that relationship in the last twenty years has has diminished with uh, any number of things that have happened in the media, scandals in hospitals, miscarriages of justice, etc. So I think the public at large are more, a little bit more sceptical. But this book really uh, has emphasised that the professionals are there from their, um, from their viewpoint, their agenda is to, is to have that uh, positional power and to be seen as having the inf information. This book really highlights that often and in very serious cases, the so-called professional actually doesn't know what they're talking about um, and can be profoundly wrong. And as Meryn said earlier, you know, the anecdote at the beginning shows that those those moments, you know, might have been a one or two second decision to say something, mm -hmm. can have profound effects that will affect someone for years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I've really enjoyed that aspect of the book that makes you think a great deal harder about how you how you make decisions. It makes me think of a book called Fa Fa Fast, Fast and Slow. Yeah. You know, we're really we're really primed and biased to make fast decisions because they're easy. Whereas to stand back and think a bit harder and a bit longer and look at the problem um, more deeply, it takes a lot of effort. And if you're in a job and you're pressurized and you have time pressure, of course, mm -hmm. um, then people definitely make decisions which quite frankly are wrong. Hmm? Absolutely. For those uh, listening, watching, uh, it's a book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Uh, Nobel Laureate, really good reader. <laughs> Maybe we'll bring that to the book club another time. Meran, what did you find most interesting, most enjoyable about this book? I thought the the way he set it out, uh, right at the beginning, he talked about Kant's dream, which was about enlightenment. So I think he kind of guided the reader through that journey. Uh, you know, uh, I think trying to use clinical scenarios, uh, ethical scenarios, philosophical kind of questions into the discourse, um, and the way that you know he tries to he tries to encourage uh, uh, critical appraisal. He tries to encourage uh, simplicity and understanding, but at the same time, that should mean in terms of simplicity and communication, and the the idea that as as uh, not just clinicians but as people. Uh, we need to be uh, daring to know. So we, we need to have that kind of courage to ask that uh, that next question. So I really enjoyed the, um, uh, the, uh, the chapter on informed or uninformed consent. Um, so it really kind of took me aback that, you know, the concept of consent is actually quite new if we think about time. Um, it's just only a concept that's really emerged towards the end of 20th century. And that's, um, you know, we're talking uh, just after I was born. Um, so it's it, it's a thing that's evolved. And obviously GMC, the Great, um, General Medical Council, have also recently updated their um, consent uh, and how to keep the patient integral to decision making, which is very much against what people thought right at the beginning in 1984 when uh, I think it was uh, K-Fratz. Um, yeah, so I think that the way he was ridiculed in terms of actually seeing what is important for the patient itself and how can we guide and address those concerns appropriately. No, that's really interesting. Uh, I mean, after reading this book, I, I was trying to relate it to things that actually I would see and read. For instance, I was just reading the other day in 
traditional times, I gather in uh, Jewish law, if there was someone who's being tried for an actual uh, crime, if three or four of them, all the judges agree that he was guilty, that meant he wasn't guilty because uh, they couldn't have mm. that level of certainty. That level of certainty meant that, you know, they've got it wrong here and there should have been some indecision. So thinking about it now, it's interesting when you actually relate this book to things that you know from historical backgrounds or other things. And the author does go on and he talks about religion as a form of certainty for many people. They believe that their path is the right path and so on. And so we're all trying to find certainty in our lives. And I think that's really interesting and something I take into my working life in, in trying to understand someone's cultural religious background now when I see them. Um, great. I want to move on to uh, what you found least interesting. I'll start with what I, I did. I mean, uh, I'll make it an obvious thing. I really like the type font. It's too small for me. I wear glasses. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that was just irritating all throughout. Just extend it another 50, 100 pages and uh, make it a uh, higher uh, type font would have really helped me because the books I've read um, uh, are much bigger. And obviously, I think there was a lot of emphasis on anecdotes to try and explain something, but it, it means that you lose the ability to actually think deeply. For instance, there's one episode or he talks about uh, accidents, car accidents in particular, and he talks about American roads, German roads, British roads, and, and trying to give you the analogy of which is the safest, and then Greek roads, Portuguese, but it could be to do with many different factors, of course. It's not just that public transportation is one factor. It could be the maker for cars in those countries, maybe the ones that are newer cars in some other countries than others. So, I mean, I couldn't really understand where, where the author was going sometimes with things. It was as if he had a, a premise that he wanted to prove and he just fitted things around to make it, uh, apart from actually trying to expand on the point. But Ray, what did you find that you thought wasn't the best part of the book or something you didn't like? Um, I think the only thing, uh, the two things I would say is that it, it isn't the easiest to read. There are some anecdotes and certainly as I mentioned, the first one was quite shocking. Um, but I didn't find it particularly a fun book to read. Although there is that section at the back, which is called fun, um, to make you think think of numbers. Um, it actually makes your head hurt trying to work some of them out. Uh, and there's not a lot in the book that makes you laugh out loud. It, it's quite a serious book. Um, and then in terms of the the lessons I've used, there's a bit of um, repetition with some of the examples. So maybe, maybe the examples about mammography and the screening test, which are repeated uh, several times in the book, Maybe they could have had a, a sort of a separate chapter and then really emphasized the learning points from each of them. You know, or even at the end of each chapter, maybe a little summary of what the what the key message was in each of those chapters would have been helpful. Um, it, 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 isn't, it isn't a book that flows, I would say. Hmm? Completely agree. Meron, anything you thought to put you off a bit about the book? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, th I, th I thought um, the flow was clearly interrupted I, th I thought that was a good idea right and just of how actually having summary points uh you know key things to learn from each chapter because it felt very much like uh something for clinicians and that's that's usually a kind of a, a process that uh, we find clinicians textbooks uh, a, a way of summarizing i, th I found myself going to and froing from different chapters um it just interrupted the flow i actually quite like the um the little quotes at the beginning so um made me made me think but then um sometimes i just got lost in the whole uh detail of the way he was explaining things but that i did i did sometimes wonder whether he is in a state of illusion of certainty himself um so 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 that came to my mind so um so yeah so it's it's i found it very much challenging the uh the decision maker but it's very little about the patient their perspectives what they thought um how were things explained what what you know uh, when when the emphasis was clearly made about the importance of patients they featured very little in this great Ray, you also mentioned, obviously, Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Can you tell the listeners, viewers, what made you think of uh, that book when you read this? Well, for Fast and Slow is a, a fantastic book, and it's an even harder book to read. You really you read it fast once, and then you read it slowly lots of times. Um, it's a, <laughs> it is a hard book, but it, it really emphasizes, which is in this book, it's this whole business of having to, having to think hard and, and think much slower. So you know, you're given... You're given a statistic or a fact, and it's very easy to accept that at face value and not think of the next question. And generally how we communicate, I was thinking this earlier today, um, particularly in medicine, the person in a, in, a, in, a, in a committee or with a group is often the loudest voice, the most confident voice that will run the show. 
Uh, and the quiet person who's doing the deep thinking and the slow thinking is often ignored. So the, the, the fastest decision is often the one that, that, that goes ahead. Whereas in actual fact, it's often, it's often the decision that would have been come to had you spent some time thinking harder about it, that would be correct. So in, in this book, it tells you repeatedly that if you're, given a, if you're given a fact in isolation, you need to know the reference group. You need to know the size of the population we're talking about. Yeah, you need to know the facts, uh, whether it's you know whether these are uh, um, these facts are in isolation or are they linked to something else? And it, the whole book is all about just thinking harder and slower. And fast and slow is all about that. Um, and of course, fast and slow really goes into heavily about being more self-aware of your your personal um, bias and then in 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 any situation. And every, as I said earlier, everyone in this book, be it a lawyer or a judge or a doctor, you do have an agenda, you have some positional power. And whether you like it or not, there's going to be a level of personal bias going on. No, that's really good. Yeah, I, I like that concept of positional power. I think sometimes as clinicians, we, we always have to be mindful of that, that when we, we talk due, due to just the fact of uh, our status in society, that there is a degree of positional power. It's always good to have that checked and uh, kept in the background. Um, to me, this book reminded me of a book called How Doctors Think. I don't know if either of you have either seen that or read it. No? I'm getting no nods there. That's fine. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great book by Jerome Groupman. Uh, I hope to bring it to the book club at a, a later time. Changed my practice completely differently in terms of um, sort of thinking errors that you can make. A bit like Daniel Kahneman's, but obviously more focused towards medicine. Obviously, Daniel Kahneman's a Nobel laureate, you know, in the economic field, whereas uh, Jerome Groupman's a straight physician. And so he talks about when we actually have hanger diagnosis, we don't think about alternative diagnoses. We think very quickly about what we've read or what we've seen recently and try and fit it around that. We don't always revisit diagnosis quickly enough and so on and so forth. So um, so that's a wonderful book that this made me think about. Anything, Mehran, this book made you think about or a film or anything in the, the literature or just the wider society? It's just the uh, the daring to question concept. So it just really reminded me of the Matrix. <laughs> so um, so the kind of the you know the all knowing Oracle who uh, was in the position that he knew everything because he knew what state of ignorance he found himself in. So so I thought you know there there were some elements within this book. You know there's lots of philosophical kind of nuances that this kind of resonates with. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's René Descartes, there's Aristotle. He tries to bring all these uh, individuals in, as well as Immanuel Kant. Um, but I'd, I'd probably say you, can, you could argue even Inception, the way uh, you know the the reality and um, and the dreamlike state, how they can get kind of um, coalesced and can't really tell the difference between the two. So it's um, so yeah. So it's it's that. It's that aspect of uncertainty. How how do we become more certain? Um, and that's that's uh, quite an interesting and probably will take a while to try to explain. Excellent. Um, at this stage, normally we move on to emotions evoked by the author, but it's not that kind of a book, actually. Uh, it's mm. quite a, a logical book, and, it, and it's not like a storybook or uh, fiction. So I think we can gloss over that, unless any of you have any burning desire to talk about emotions about this book. It's a very German book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to so, say that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so. All I know is that the beat is at penalties all the time, so that's all I've got to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, in some ways, I mean, yeah, I don't want to give that stereotype any uh, leverage about it. <laughs> yeah. Lack of humour we've had already and so on. No, I, I think it's a, it's a great book and factually detailed. I mean, just going back to the beginning, what I said, he works at the Max Planck Institute. I know, Ray, I spoke to you about this off air, but when I was doing A-level physics, my physics teacher was in love with Max Planck. And he said, you know, this guy, if there was an Einstein, we'd all be talking about Max Planck all the time. So you know the credibility of this author, you know, to have the top position there. And really, from there on, he does have the gravitas to speak so authoritatively about this topic. I want to move on to uh, something that we talk about in the book club, and that's the, the actual message that the book is trying to portray, what the author is trying to uh, captivate the readers to understand, explain to them, uh, what ideas that he or she is trying to illustrate, and really the message. In the same way that many films or movies are what we call message movies, they're not just popcorn type things. This is not a popcorn type book. Um, you know, there's a message behind it all. Ray, what, what did you think <coughs> he, is the message that he's trying to give to readers that, at the end of this book? But he's got it in the, the final the final parts of the book. There's the little fun section, 
is to get you to begin to think very clearly. But I think it's very easy to have a, a, a commentary on things, but you actually want people to do something active. So I think it's good at the end of the book, he's got that fun section to, to make people think. But then he's also got the section, which is, you know, how how we can teach people to think more, more, more clearly and to be not bamboozled by by the numbers. So the whole dare, dare to know, the whole uh, the whole business of being prepared to ask the question and get someone to explain the figures. I think that's to me is the key. The key message is that don't don't be ignorant and don't be scared to ask the hard question. It's really powerful. Mehran, what do you think the main messages are from this book that he wants the audience to take away? Um, I guess it's, it depends on which um, population you, you sit in. So I think from a clinician perspective, um, I think it's important to um, try to not to be too paternalistic in terms of your decision making and the way you express those kind of options. Um, so he he keeps kind of bringing in the the way that you know it's not about um it's not about what you think the patient should do it's about presenting the data in a digestible way and trying to empower the patient and making the decision putting their kind of needs and everything into perspective so that that you know fortunately and unfortunately that takes time um and it's it's kind of acknowledging that perhaps we need to to spend that time uh to fully understand what what kind of decision is best for that person yeah that's great um time is always against us in this book club so i want to quickly move through um there was one uh, issue too with the illusion of certainty which you touched upon earlier and i want to give a few minutes towards that now so that's a particular chapter early on in the book where um, uh, and I'll get all of your thoughts on this, but there was one interesting anecdote and he talked about when he was a child, he was told on good authority, whatever that means, good authority, uh, never to drink water after eating cherries or I would get very sick and might even die. And I, I thought that was quite a heartwarming little story. I don't know what his age was. He doesn't reveal that to us, but uh, obviously he saw that with an English friend uh, and he said he'd never heard of it and did it and nothing happened. And I, I think it's a really good example of maybe either sort of uh, stories that we've heard when we're growing up that we decided that wasn't true. I think uh, the one I heard about was not to eat any seeds, otherwise uh, a tree will grow inside your stomach. So I had that one when I was growing up for a long time. I'd eat nothing with seeds in until I realized that's uh, something sort of made up. But I mean, was there more to it there than that? Or you know, in terms of the illusion of certainty, what did you take out of that chapter? Well, on, on that particular story, when I was a physician in the hospital, I did an inf inflammatory bowel disease uh, um, six, six months, and there was an elderly lady came in in her 70s, and I was an SHO, so I wasn't intimidating, and she was prepared to speak to me and dared, dared to ask a question. And she said, is it, is it true I can only eat rice and potatoes? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> She said, yeah, I've been, I've been eating rice and potatoes for 30 years because a doctor said to me, my inflammatory bowel disease, if I eat anything spicy or these vegetables or eat meat or anything, I can only eat rice and potatoes. And literally this lady had done this for decades. So it kind of emphasizes how, how, how dangerous being certain is you know, in, that, in that situation and, and the effect it can have on someone for an, for an awful long time. Um, I'm in my 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 own um, work, and I, th I thought hard about how you share information with patients, um, and, it, and and certainly ex ex explaining risk. And everyone everyone wants to know um, what the risk is for them, but of course you can only give an an overview, um, and and you you really can't promise anyone that they'll have a particular outcome. And in op ophthalmology, um, probably one, once a month or more, we'll operate on someone who who has an only eye, so they've, they've lost to the eye. So that's a a, a a a huge decision for someone to go ahead and go for surgery because they want the certainty as much as they can of knowing the operation is going to be successful. So somehow you've still got to communicate those risks, but in the most reassuring but realistic way you can. Um, and a lot about a lot of that for me is about going beyond the trying to break down the un, the uncertainty by letting people know what will happen if things don't go correctly. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Meron, anything about illusion of certainty that you want to bring in at the stage? It reminded me of uh, something that I remember hearing, that you can't eat milk and fish at the same time. Otherwise, something drastic will suddenly happen. Um, fortunately, I never had to test that theory as I, as I grew older. But, um, but it's these kind of old wives' tales, aren't they? It's, it's just, um, I, I guess I'm, it's fair to say that a reasonable proportion actually stuck by that kind of premise, not to drink fish and milk. Um, but it's the illusion of uncertainty. I, I guess it really uh, amplifies what's, what kind of your what's your predisposition uh, predisposition so when you look at a, a 3d cube is it something that you see as going into the book or something that's popping out so um so i think it it kind of becomes quite interesting in uh, in terms of how that uh, initial response can be developed and and that our mind can really play tricks on us and fill in fill in the blanks um I do have to say I'm willing to challenge uh, him for two hundred fifty dollars about the uh, the tables because it really does look uh, disproportionate. So um, I'd really be interested to to take his perspective on that. I like the way the guy ran off before the end of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sore loser if you ever met one I like that. Um, but, but, but that's yeah. assuming. <laughs> that's assuming that he thought I'm going to lose this. He may have just you know want to go home. Who knows? Um, yeah, absolutely. No, I think so. the illusion of certainty re really struck a chord with me because I think I've grown up with so many things being told by these good authority <laughs> figures, as he describes it, coming back to that terminology, whether that be religious figures, uh, people of senior positions in terms of age or social class position, hierarchy in society, authority in terms of police and so on. You're told on authority and, and that, that gives you the level of certainty. I, another a uh, humorous anecdote that I had that I can share is that when I was about eight years old, um, in terms of supplication, I would go like this. And then um, one of my relatives said, don't do it like that. Otherwise, everything you say, God won't hear. I was like, right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, I thought I just said, right, it's going to be this way. But I mean, <laughs> he was playing on my, on a, obviously, my incomplete understanding of how God may act at that stage. But if he's everywhere, it doesn't matter. But obviously, I, I took it, you know, he was 20 years older than me. So I mean, whenever someone's telling you and you're at an impressionable stage in your life and you, you're, you're told something, um, it's not to take it on face value. I, I took that on board, really, from this book. And I think as we're in a pandemic, that's really important as well. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So on, on on that topic, when you when you're teaching junior doctors or medical students, or when you were younger, and you go through your your education process, you go from this from this position of not knowing much about anything, and you're grasping to have some facts, you're grasping for some black and white facts to give to give you that certainty. So you spend all this time in your professional career, whatever you are, passing exams and learning facts and getting certainty that you understand the issues or the nature of your speciality. Of course, when you become more senior, you realize that most of these so-called facts you've been told aren't actually facts, and that there's a huge uh, number of shades of gray. And the older you get and the wiser you get, you realize that everything's shades of gray, and we're actually not that certain about a, gr a, a great many things. Um, and although this book doesn't say that specifically, I think that is part of the issue is once you've gone through your career and you spent your whole time learning facts and being certain, and then suddenly you're bestowed with your title as expert, it's, it's, uh, it takes a bit of insight and self-awareness to realize that actually you're not the expert. You've just passed these tests. And actually now you need to try and learn things even better. I think that's a really good point you demonstrated. Just getting the CCT doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're the top at everything. It just means you've completed the actual training. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good book on terms of humility and remembering that there's always someone who knows more than you. We've always got to learn from someone else's experiences. Is that what you found, Mehran, from this book? Yeah, and I, I was trying to relate that again to the junior doctor's position, Ray. Um, if you ask the consultant, why did you make this choice? Um, you can have two variations of, of response. <laughs> you can either educate or just say, "Well, that's a decision that I made." Uh, and it's, I guess, it's it's important to question. It's not just what you ask, but how you ask. Um, and um, th there is, I I do sense that there is a gener generational difference. Uh, and junior doctors are uh, 
are less bound by hierarchical positions. And I think that's I think that's a good thing um, <coughs> to, to challenge the status quo or at least try to educate themselves. So I think um, I think the dare to know concept should uh, should certainly be rife in, in that group. You've, you've just I, made me think, Maran. I was teaching a group of students a few years ago about mm-hmm. eyes, um, and there's one young lad who was particularly um, thought he knew it all. Um, and I and I actually used the phrase that well, in the future. You, know, you could be seeing a patient who spent who has a rare condition who last night went on Google and spent six hours learning about it because they were really interested and can rem- and can remember everything about it because it's literally it's fresh in their memory you know and they know in your clinic and you don't know anything about this you might have heard of it once in your exam are you really mm-hmm. gonna pretend you understand what it is and he's like, well, I would always know more than them. I mean, even though he'd had the warning, he still wasn't listening. Yes. <laughs> but I said, okay, so tell me everything you know about Ellis Danlos syndrome. And of course, you get a clue. And, and all of these fellow students laughed a lot, which uh, it may have been the best lesson he's ever had. Hmm? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, note to self, don't attend race lecture. <laughs> race teaching is the best. I've actually been to race teaching. He's the best teacher. Uh, no, so, uh, yeah, so that is that is a classic quote, though. Yeah. Um, in, ter- in terms of the book, obviously, we know it's written by a German author. We've alluded to that at the, at the beginning. Uh, and in previous books that have been written, say, by American authors, there's Americanisms and, and also with a German author. I think it's important to mention that in terms of the context of certain things that he brings into the book. Uh, one notable thing that I found that he brought in was to do about the BSE crisis that we had in Britain uh, a few years ago where, where beef wasn't being eaten here and so on and uh, all being exported. But it looks like Germany had a, a similar one, which I was one aware of, um, although they were very certain in that all, all the beef was uh, was fine there. And obviously talking about low traffic injury rates in Germany obviously I think because he's a German author he tried to relate it back to Germany some of the anecdotes and examples for some of the audience uh, for his book and and so it's interesting to uh, read and know more about German culture and history in that sense Um, Ray did you find any Germanisms to to use the phrase that you found in this book uh, of of interest that you didn't know perhaps? Uh, Well just just the story you mentioned there I did pick up on that and if I'm right remembering the Germans did have BSC didn't they when they when they looked Mm. properly Mm. Yeah, um, but no, there was nothing else particularly, you know, other than things we've already said, which we don't need to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Mehran, anything that you found interesting that, you know, from his German perspective that he brought in, uh, as we used to often reading maybe books uh, with, by English or American authors, um, anything that you saw? It's just the, the subtle superiority that comes out uh, when, when he compares University of Michigan to, say, University of Munich. Uh, as a, as case studies, uh, how they how they kind of respond to information, you know, whether it's frequency trees or probabilities, um, and the the period of assessment was longer for German students because obviously you know they, they were intellectually perhaps more gifted. Who knows? But I think he kind of makes that statement that you know uh, baseline. I think their achievement was slightly higher. Um, so yeah, so so it is subtle that it comes comes out, but. Um, but yeah, um, don't need to add more fuel to the fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, so I guess one of the central themes is what we understand by risk, um, Ray. And uh, this is something that he's always talking about. You know, the title of the book is Reckoning with Risk. And uh, as a surgeon, y- your level of risk is different. And, and I know the GMC has come out with different uh, um, explanations and guidance to help us in managing risk and conveying that to patients. Is there something from this book that you're going to implement about how you convey perhaps risk to your patients or just the way you talk about risk in general, or maybe even just your own life and how you take risks? Um, I've thought a lot about risk when I wrote my own book. There's a whole, there was a chapter on risk. So uh, risk risk is a fascinating topic because everyone has their own, their own take on it. And I think it's fascinating that... Uh, People in one avenue of life will take a great deal of risk, and yet on another aspect of their life, maybe they're really, really careful. Um, from the book, I don't know whether you're going to come to it or not, but he does define risk and absolute risk and relative risk, um, and these are really important concepts. And he talks later on in the book about how risk can be can be used to um, uh, get an unfair advantage. If you want to sell somebody something, you can you can present risk in a certain way. Uh, you can create doubt using risk, and 
and get someone to think that this is something they they should invest in. Um, it's really important to to get a handle on it. And as a as a doctor, you know we see our pharmaceutical companies produce these drugs, and they'll talk about risks of side effects and the and the benefit risk. Um, and of course, more often than not, they'll present these figures in the way which makes their product or their drug look as good as it can possibly be. Uh, whereas if you look at the all the information, look at the the the, the number to treat or the or the absolute risk, you get a completely different feeling about it. So I think it's very important that you know when you read this book is to get a get a, a good handle on those different those different forms of risk. Absolutely, yeah. Meron, how is your perception of risk either in your professional personal life changed after you laid hands on this book? Uh, I think it's how people use you could you put potentially use the word manipulate uh, risk and what, what that kind of demonstrates. Uh, I guess we're, we're seeing some evidence of that currently. Let, let's say, for example, the COVID-19 vaccination um, and its role. It's, it's been replaced by the word effective or efficient. Now, what, what does that actually mean? Um, so it's, you know, is it the absolute risk? No, it probably isn't. It's the relative risk reduction, but no one really comments on that. No one really comments on the duration of assessment uh, and, and outcomes for, for risk. So I think, uh, and we don't really know what, what it means for the future, um, you know, in terms of the actual risk with the vaccine, um, what's the effect it's going to have, um, and, the, and the data, because it's, um, it's still not widely shared. Uh, um, so I think there's no denying risk is something that's um, uh, very important, especially for us clinicians. There's, there's obviously numbers needed to uh, treat for benefit as well as uh, needed to treat for harm. So these are kind of two two sides of the same coin, which which I found uh, increasingly interesting. Um, so I, I think it's important to to fully understand that perhaps we actually don't know, and coming across as being uncertain doesn't uh, reassure the patient a lot of the times. So it's it's a it's a, it's a fine balance of giving the right information, but also saying, you know, this is a pragmatic attempt in some cases. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think, obviously, we have three different clinicians from different uh, arenas here, and that's really interesting how we all manage risk in our different ways. Obviously, Ray, you know, if I was going towards a surgeon, I want to be in really good hands. You know, I don't want them to say at all that they're uncertain what's going to happen. you got to tell me that I'm going to get better because if you – were to mention all the different risks that I could come out with, I'm never going to go through the operation. Um, you know, so it's an interesting one how, how we all try and manage risk. And obviously, you know, if we think too much about it, we could never get to sleep because we'd always be thinking, what about that person? And, you know, did I make the right decision? You can't always be second guessing yourself. So it really made me think about risk. I want to take what Mehran said and obviously related to the pandemic now, the book. Um, that's the elephant in the room. We're reading, we're reading this in a lockdown time here in the UK. For those of you who are, who are watching this from around the world, you know, we're still under a lockdown here in the UK um, till the middle of this week. Um, so that's why we're all doing this virtually from our homes. And there's a lot to think about in terms of risk. And so the vaccination is a good place to start, whether to take it or not. The people who became volunteers for the vaccine, and we have to thank them because they obviously had a risk, although they probably weren't sure exactly of all the different risks of actually being a volunteer for that and so on. So, I mean, Ray, how do you actually um, extrapolate from this book in terms of what you can take lessons moving in for this pandemic? Well, I think the the, 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 the trees is made in the book where you look at a, a, free, a frequency tree and look at the look at the big numbers and then break that down into the, the people who have a positive effect and have a negative effect. So for the situation we're in at the moment, uh, in the UK, we've had something like 60 or 58,000 deaths from, from COVID. But I can't remember the exact figure. We've had a, a million and a half tests positive or something. I can't remember the exact figure. Um, people are talking about a 1% mortality from COVID. Um, and they're talking about a 90 to 95% effectiveness of the vaccine. So those are kind of the, the headline figures. But if you try to put those into a into a frequency tree, uh, the, there's information that's missing because we don't know how long the vaccine is effective for. We don't know what the side effects of the vaccine will be. Don't know what the long term effects of the vaccine will be. Um, we know that 99 out of 100 people are probably not going to die from COVID. 
And then if you were to use those figures in different age groups, it's going to look completely different again. Um, there are arguments going around on podcasts saying that the vaccine should be given to young people because they're more likely to be the carriers and the spreaders rather than the people who are most likely to die from it, which is the elderly population. Um, and getting all those figures into a, a frequency tree and making making sense of who truly benefits and the numbers of people you have to treat to get that benefit, it seems at the moment the UK government's approach is going to be to, to vaccinate as many people as possible, but having a, a, a tiered approach, but ultimately giving as many people the, vac the vaccine as they can. Um, it's interesting talking to colleagues how many people are quite reticent about taking a vaccine uh, because we just don't have all the information. And then that, yeah, it's an interesting point you make. Yeah, Miran. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, and that, that comes out in the book, doesn't it? If someone isn't too sure, they'll put the question back to the clinician. Would you take it? Or would you undergo this procedure? <laughs> and a lot of the times, uh, well, maybe not a lot of the times, but in that kind of situation, the clinician said, no, I wouldn't. But considering your circumstances, uh, I would consider it. Um, so, yeah, as you said, there's, as you said, Ray, the, the populations and the vulnerabilities, it's, it's really tricky. Some, some say the care home population is the most vulnerable, so they should, they should get the most, uh, you know, focus in terms of getting the vaccine. Um, but at the same time, in terms of the safety data, it really isn't there. Um, and I'm not sure how many proportion of the, the people that were in these trials, which are single blinded, not even double blinded, um, that you know what what was the what was the adverse effects what was the uh, impact on multiple organs uh, etc comorbidities what well, what's the you know so it's leaves me with more questions than answers um well that's always a, a good thing about a book i think to leave you <laughs> leave you almost wanting more i think is what i understood about that no that's good um there was a section that i want to speak about and that was enumeracy the author has quite a strong hold about making more people numerate. He said that we often have an understanding of other things, but not actually about numbers. Uh, a lot of people can read and write perhaps in the developed world, but they don't have a good grasp of numbers. And, it, and in a way, I felt like it was a, a mini tutorial uh, midway through the book where he's trying to explain what different numbers. I don't want to go through all of it because I think it's quite difficult on uh, a show like this to break down absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction. And even um, for so many of us, I think we just learned it for exams and then it, we forgot a lot of it uh, in terms of a pragmatic point. And I don't think it would serve too much to actually explain that to what may be a non-medical audience watching this. But in terms of numeracy and his drive to get as more numerate, Ray, what did you think of that theme of the book? It's really, really important because we do use numbers all the time. You know, we talk about the percentage or or so many out of 100 or one in 10 or what, however we're going to frame it, um, it's really important that we're, we're clear and that the patient, whoever we're talking to, under, understands what we've said and the way we've meant to say it. Uh, I was showing a long time ago, if you, want to, if you want to talk about risk, rather than use a percentage or a number to have a, a diagram, with lots of little lots of little men on it or women whichever you want um and you sh and you shade them in because looking at that is a far easier way for people to understand than talking about a percentage or or, or one and whatever they, you know, they can physically see it there's a crowd that one person in the crowd will be affected mm -hmm. um uh, i mean a lot of people have gone to all level mass perhaps um whatever grade they've got and then may never think mathematically again in their life you know, they're going to go to the shop, they'll get change for their money, but they're not really thinking about uh, percentages and, and probabilities, etc. cetera. Um, but if you're a professional, and I think the book is mostly aimed at professionals, and I think mm. it kind of emphasizes there's a, there's a bit of a duty to spend a bit more time thinking about, thinking about numbers and what they actually mean. Yeah. Mehran, what did you make of the numeracy issue? Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I, I guess we we all know as as children, the, some of the key skills are able to to read, write, and understand numbers. But as you get older, the numbers just kind of fall by the wayside. And and H. G. Wells talks about the statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. So this has kind of fueled the inability to reason um, with about the the lack of understanding and and risk. So I think people can exploit. 
uh, an individual in, in those kind of situations. I guess if it's it's apparent when when I have discussions, simple thing like taking out a mortgage or remortgaging, um, and what what kind of information some people are looking for is grossly uh, very broad. Um, but you know we, we don't really see a mortgage as the biggest debt we're going to have hanging over our heads and how to clear it as quickly as possible. Um, some some people want to keep the the monthly amount as low as possible so that they can enjoy the fruits of life that they perceive it to be. Uh, so it's it's very much um, you know people have different priorities I guess. But it's uh, but there is a lack of understanding about um, the importance of numbers, especially when it comes to money, as as Ray suggested. Um, you know, very much kind of a, a state of docility, which the book talks about. Yeah, excellent. There was another theme in the book I'd like to touch up on now, and that was uh, about screening. It mentions it several times, in particular breast cancer, but other things. And I think screening has come into critical discussion in many academic and non-academic circles in society at the moment. Uh, for those of us in the UK, we don't have a national screening program for, say, prostate cancer, but we do for breast cancer and other cancers. And uh, and there's obviously uh, different ways that is decided in terms of what we do. And then other countries are different in having no screening programs to even far more. So, I mean, Ray, what, what first of all, what's your perception of screening as a tool for improving healthcare in the say let's start with the UK and in terms of what the book has to say about it. Well I think but it comes to the examples for the breast screening, the prostate screening, um, uh, colon cancer screening and, he, and he, he makes the point in the book that nearly all of your screening programs are flawed from a numerical point of view and a probability point of view. They're flawed in terms of how they're used and they're flawed in terms of how the information is shared to people. Um, so people make the assumption if you're in a screening program, this will protect you from a disease or maybe change the outcome of a disease. Well, there's lots of evidence he's got in the book to suggest that isn't the case. Um, for men, for example, with, with a prostate cancer, um, something we probably all, all know, uh, if you do autopsies in men who died over 80, a third of them have prostate cancer. But it's asymptomatic. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them. Um, and there's been... Uh, from, from memory, there's been breast screening uh, issues in this country, uh, people having un, un, unnecessary surgery. Um, and, the, and, of course, the other fact with all these things to do with pathology um, is there can be errors in terms of the interpretation of, of the pathology. So it's far more uh, detailed and complex than just a simple screening program. Um, I know we were taught as, as medical students, screening programs have to have something like 10 10 criteria for it to work but it, it appears to me that a lot of the screening programs we have don't actually match these things so quite a lot of it is to me maybe is more political than than scientific Mehran in terms of uh, screening what's your understanding of screening um, and uh, where it's going and what the book has to say about it. Well, it goes into quite some detail on the importance of uh, breast screening and the different areas and one should, should look at. So it also talks about how there are some silent illnesses such as colorectal cancer that go unnoticed in terms of the rate of incidence as well as the risk uh, risk and rate of mortality. So it's it's really interesting. I found this topic quite fascinating because the screening actually reduced the risk of mortality. The argument is no. Uh, I guess it really depends what you what you're screening. But um, but does early identification mean that someone has better outcomes? Um, because there's lots of other things that are important for someone's quality of life, whether it's aesthetically or going through uh, treatment. Uh, and the side effects um, gone through that, as well as getting it right in the first place. Because, um, you know, time is the best witness. Sometimes you don't have enough time to uh, kind of uh, fully understand what, what the uh, state of play is. So I thought screening is quite um, quite interesting concept. And, you know, the, the jury is out there in terms of efficacy. Yeah, I think I think screening is going to be a discussion we won't be able to solve tonight. And uh, 
even in, in my professional career, it's really taken a lot of interest now in many circles about efficacy. And perhaps that's partly because of the way that we fund many of these things. If it was an unlimited uh, pot of money, then perhaps we'd look at it differently. But we're always having to do a cost benefit analysis with these sort of things in the UK. Um, before we get to the, the final round roundup and your final thoughts and the, the mark, um, one last bit really I wanted was really about your learning points and things that you took that you want to implement moving forward from this book, actually what you learnt uh, and actually you took out that you're going to implement it in your practice. Ray, start with you on this. So I have, I have already thought a lot about risk in the past, but I think this book has uh, made me think even harder. Um, I'm actually trying to finish writing an article that's been going on for a while, which is about risk in glaucoma, which I did a presentation on just a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm actually trying to finish a paper on that. And I think I'll be using this book as some reference material for it because it's been, it is a, a very good book. And Mehran, in terms of um, learning points from the book and what you're going to implement in your own practice, what did you take from this book? Um, I think trying the importance of having balance, the ability to receive as well as reject in equal measure. Um, so I think it talks about um, you can't be a scissor if one if one arm doesn't exist. So it's so it's important to 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 challenge the status quo. And it's important to ask the right questions. And I think that's where the numeracy things is uh, is really pointing down uh, onto. So the, the statistics is not really my strength. Um, and clearly this has got lots of references and definitions, but um, there's, there's clearly a, you know, an opportunity to, to develop in that regard. Excellent. Yeah, I think statisticians have really taken a, a big lead in whilst in the pandemic and mm. we're often uh, at their mercy unless we have a good grounding or baseline level of knowledge. And, uh, and it's good to, to see that explained for the general reader if they stick with the book. Good. Um, I think we've covered through a lot of topics uh, in a lot of detail about the book. Uh, I've tried to pick out some of the major themes. I think now is as any good a time as any to just have a roundup. Ray, your final thoughts and, of course, that golden mark out of five for the audience. Thanks, Ray. Oh, I, say, I, I did enjoy the book. I found it very useful. It's made me think very hard. I think I said to you, you mentioned at the beginning, I think as uh, anyone who's anyone who's talking about risk to patients as a doctor should should read this book. Um, because they'll definitely challenge them and they'll and they'll learn something. Um, I think I'd give it an eight. Oh, five. <laughs> <laughs> That's five. <laughs> yes. no I'd give it. If it's out of five, I'll give it a nine. <laughs> because I'm completely enumerate. <laughs> That's hilarious. Meron, what would you give out? Ten, five, or whatever number you want? <laughs> Well, interesting that this book, I actually got it as an ebook, and then reading, I think, about 10 pages into it, I think I decided, you know, I actually need a hard copy of this. So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to give it a solid four out of five. Okay, that was a, that was a legal ebook, by the way. May yeah, may absolutely. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd go for four out of five. I think eight out of ten is four out of five if for my new results. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know you're testing me now. Um, so that's great. Okay, a four out of five. So hopefully, good. We can uh, say that for people watching that to go out and uh, have a read of it. And we'd be love to hear your thoughts. And uh, do email us if you do read it on medtalks at gmail .com. Um, before we actually finish, Mehran, I know you're going to introduce uh, next month's book. I want to thank Ray for joining us as our guest for tonight, and I hope that you will be able to join us uh, on future shows. I know you've joined us on the Med Talks talking about ophthalmology and also our global webinar and also uh, medical presentations. So uh, you're definitely deserving of one of these T-shirts. You need to give me my address, <laughs> your address. Um, and on Tuesday, we've got uh, another episode coming up on Med Talks. You can see it scrolling at the bottom there. Our next show uh, with Dr. Diraj Choudhury and Dr. Kuram Sadiq, uh, two good friends of ours, discussing ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, December 1st, Tuesday, 8 till 9 p.m. Marian, can I ask you to introduce uh, next month's book, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, so next month's book is uh, from a um, psychologist, Professor Jordan Peterson. He's written a book called 12 Rules for Life. He's actually um, 
uh, written quite a few books, but this is the, the thing that really grabbed my attention. It's, it's called 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos, which was released in 2018. Uh, he's actually a psychologist based in Canada, but I, I guess it's fair to say it, uh, ever since the book and uh, his popularity, he's uh, probably doing less kind of clinical activity. So it's so it gives you very practical um as well as kind of nudges and trying to understand yourself as well as what's important, purpose of life, meaning of life, um, trying to get things in order, standing up with your back straight. So those, those some some interesting concepts, but it, it's kind of how he explains it, which is quite fascinating. So it's, um, you know, he's, I think he started off by answering questions on Quora uh, and then uh, developed that, you know, he really had a, a liking to discuss things further. So yeah, join us last Sunday of next month. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I also want to just plug quickly that MedTalks, we're hoping to do a, a special webinar to do with vaccination coming up. Uh, so hopefully that will be of interest to the public. And that's on Wednesday, 16th of December. And I think, Ray, you, you brought up a lot of interesting questions that we'll definitely pose to the experts on that evening, uh, 7 p.m., hopefully UK time. We should be having a, a virologist from the UK as long uh, and a doctor from the USA as well. And uh, since uh, this whole month, there's been an extra vaccine that's come out and so on. So there's a lot to discuss uh, midway through the month. Thank you both for joining me this evening uh, on a, a cold evening here now, November 29th. And it was a pleasure to have both your company and I learned a lot. And it's good to have that fertilization and cross fertilization of ideas with you both. And I hope you both stay safe, stay well, and see you both soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for him and Ray. Thank you.